Welcome to Conversations on Social Issues. My name is Kimberly T. Malone, and I'm one of the Reference and Instruction Librarians here, and also the partner of this series. We're so happy to have you here. Um, but before we actually get started today, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So if we can all take a moment, um, settle in. And on behalf of Seattle Central College and the library, I want to acknowledge the land on which we stand and sit today as the traditional home of the Coast Salish people, the traditional homes of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulela, and Muckleshoot Nations. So without them, we wouldn't have access to this gathering and this place today for this dialogue. So I ask that you take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here.
start with you, Olaf, and Olaf, and just go down the line. If you just tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you kind of came into the work that you do currently. Uh, well, my name is Olaf, and since I appreciate everybody having me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, black liberation in Seattle. And I first want to say that it's pretty apparent that I'm not black. Uh, but, you know, and that's that's one of the first questions when I was asked to speak on this panel and uh, I wanted to forefront uh, black folks and have black folks give that, be centered around this conversation, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of, especially among, among I think among Asian communities, uh, there's a lot of anti-blackness uh, among communities, period, and I think, uh, in Seattle, being Seattle is quote unquote progressive or liberal, a lot of that anti-blackness is hidden and a lot of the kids and the youth that are impacted uh, tend to get marginalized because of that hiddenness. So because of that progressiveness and liberalism of Seattle and for, for myself, uh, I stand in solidarity with black folks because I'm directly impacted myself. I, uh, as, a, as a young person growing up in poverty in, in the South End, in Tacoma, uh, yeah, like I, I was put on that same pathway to uh, mass incarceration, to the prison and so complex, to the school, school to prison pipeline, and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. That's why I stand with youth. That's why I stand with black and brown folks in solidarity and fighting against the uh, progressiveness of Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Hankerson. I came into this work. Uh, I'm a kid that grew up in the South in Georgia. I come up here in 1986 to meet my mother for the first time. And then after being here for one year, I was charged, accused, and convicted for a crime I didn't commit, and I was sentenced to die. And after 23 years, thank God, this is all because of God, that the governor granted me a pardon. And in November, I mean, uh, April 2009, I was the first man in Washington State to ever come home from prison after being sentenced to die. Mm -hmm. I commit myself to the I feel looking for liberation in Seattle, so mm -hmm. I don't know where this, this conversation, conversation is going to go. But I committed to this work because I did not forget the brothers and now the sisters that we left behind in those cages that we call prisons. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to hopefully change the policies and address these issues because mass incarceration starts right here in this room. To prevent to stop it because policies is not going to be the way that they're going to politicize our way out of this. And our kids are getting smothered, snatched up, killed by the police, filled up in our prison system, which is no different than what Juneteenth was about back 300 years ago. So it's funny we have this conversation 300 years later. But that's why I do what I do. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. So I'm Sean Wheeler, and I work as the political director for Teams and Joint Council. Um, in that capacity, um, I do organizing around um, political action and workers' rights. So a lot of my work is done in Olympia on the legislative level. Um, so I won't say it's how I came into labor. Like a lot of my people, we just kind of stumbled into union jobs. Um, but while you're there, you realize the benefits and impacts of labor um, and what they have on the community and what they have on our demographics as well. And so I'm usually the, the token one, right? Um, especially in the world of politics. I come from the building trades. I'm sure a lot of people <coughs> workers don't look like me. Um, so when I'm in these spaces, I'm often um, overlooked or overshadowed. And I think I gave our organization moral license to continue with the behavior. Um, they opened the door for Shawnee, right? So now we can close it because we already have our, our quota met. And in that space, I realized that's not okay. And as long as I have this platform, I want to make sure that um, in my position that I have, that I can keep that door open for my community to empower them as well. What's up, y'all? I'm Jarrell Davis. I go by Real Be Free. I'm born and raised myself in this Seattle and here my whole life. Um, and I, I got into this work by staying in the place that I was raised. I have to acknowledge my elders because um, I'm definitely a child that was raised in a village. Um, and so in this room right now, I see people that are students that I've worked with that are now some of my best friends, two educators that I've had since I was in elementary school. And being in this city for 26 plus years, I can't really go nowhere without seeing that around me, um, which is a blessing. Um, and so I spend a lot of my organizing and work in education. I work with young people. I work at Rainier Beach High School. And I spend a lot of my organizing in the Rainier Beach neighborhood. 
Uh, we have a number of different ways that we uh, implement liberatory education. We have summer program. I work during the school year to implement restorative justice and transformative justice at the school level. Um, so I work with the administration, fighting them in a similar way we're fighting progressively in the city, um, as well as we have an autonomous community safety project called the Corner Readers at Rainier Beach. And I got a shout out, Marion Bio, who's a student here and a graduate from Rainier Beach, who is also a pioneer in that project. Um, work with the Seattle People's Party, been a part of the No New Youth Jail campaign. Um, and on, on top of all that, I'm an artist, I'm a musician, um, and I make sure that everybody knows what my message is and my music, so I'm not one of these like, Corny rappers that you know act like we got out real stuff, but then you don't actually see them doing it. Now, in fact, actually, I get criticized for how uh, blunt and straight up I am in my music um, because I don't want to be somebody that's halfway or on the fence. Um, and shout out to No New Jail tomorrow night. We got a house party fundraiser. Olaf might take more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do too many plugs right now. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna to you. Yeah. And I got to shout out my auntie KL who's in the house as well. OG organizer in the city who raised yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you know, yeah, and you all are inv involved in some very important work in the city and have been involved in a lot of it. Mass incarceration, housing, climate, labor, like kind of you name it. And so, it's just if you can just maybe, uh, and then Ishani will start with you, if you can just kind of like tell us some um, some of the issues that your work kind of focuses on and how they impact communities of color in Seattle um, and kind of like the type like the strategies, tactic work that you're doing to kind of confront some of these Two minutes. Yeah. And I'll focus on that work. Because we could be here all day to unpack a lot of this, right? So I'll be very brief in my, my comments. Um, it's no surprise when we talk about organized labor and you think of the Little Boys Club. Um, it's definitely not a place that's inviting, um, welcoming. Um, it's not easy to navigate a lot of these spaces. And so it took me a long time um, to figure that out. And so being in the position that I'm in, um, I often get to sit with decision makers who make decisions for the community for us, right? It's like, Growing up, my mom would never let me wear pants, but I got to choose if I wanted to wear a yellow dress or a pink dress. That's not true participation. That's not true involvement. That's um, not real relationship building. So Labor's approach this year, um, having new leadership. Um, April Sims was supposed to come today and speak. She is our secretary treasurer for the Washington State Labor Council, which is the umbrella of all of the labor organizations in Washington State. And she's the first black person and woman to be in that position. Um, and so I'm definitely seeing the dichotomy of what labor is now currently and where we're moving to um, in a better direction. So we're looking at a three-pronged approach because not one thing can stop um, or dismantle the systems that we work within. So one is internal organizing and educating. Um, we can't clean up our community if our house is messy. Mm. So that's a lot of um, tackling, looking at inequity. Um, labor was based on equality, right? I make the same as my male counterparts which is not a like corporate America. So in that sense, we're very good. Um, <coughs> the discrepancy is there's 17 of them and one Ashani. So even though there's equality, there's no equity. And, and that's something that we're looking at building, and we're doing that a lot with um, organizations and labor called um, Coalition Black Trade Unionists, um, A. Philip Randolph Institute. So there's a lot of internal um, training that we're working on in dialogue and policies. Um, the second approach is, like I talked about, community building. <coughs> Um, before labor used to have community stewards, so we would go out in the communities and ask them, what is it that we could do for you? How can we help you? Um, but a lot of our white members didn't like that notion because we were taking away from our resources for them, um, not focusing on you know wages, hours, and working conditions, just looking at um, the community as another entity, not really part of us, um, very siloed. And so we're looking at how do we build true relationship building, right? Not, not transactional, not smash and dash, right? real intimate building, um, and that's through um, listening sessions. So we've been going around and talking with communities on what they need, not what we're telling them they need. Um, and also in that it's, from the union, I didn't just get a good job, I got empowerment, I got opportunities. And so how do we then take that and transition that um, and giving that back? Not donating turkeys at Thanksgiving, not going in and cleaning up a park, but true empowerment, and that's through a job. Um, economic dignity is the reason that I'm able to do what I'm able to do, provide for my family, that my family, where I came from, didn't have. Um, and so 
a lot of what we're doing now is looking at schools and going into prisons and also into um, transitional housing and talking about trade jobs. Not everybody wants to go to college. I know we're at school right now and I'm not, not in education, um, but I don't have a four-year degree. I went straight into the trades and got a lot of my education um, and training along the way with these. Um, but I was able to buy my first home at 21 years old. No college debt. Um, I have savings for my children to go to college if they so choose to. Right? I have a middle class background <coughs> now that I didn't have growing up. And I was able to get that because of the union. So why don't we offer more of that to our communities instead of a handout? Instead of mm -hmm. um, giving them a fish to teach our community to fish. And so that's the, the second approach. And the third approach is through policy and legislation. Um, in my day job, I get to work in Olympia as a lobbyist. Um, and this, like I said before, there's not many Shawnees down in Olympia. And so because of that, we have a lot of decision makers and policy makers looking at legislation through their own lens and not our lens and telling us what's good for us, um, but not looking at it in a practical manner. And so um, having more um, people of color down in Olympia to lobby on behalf of labor, we worked really hard with communities on Initiative I-1000 this year, uh, making sure that passed. And that took a lot of work in getting buy-in internally to even go out there and do this work. Um, and then there's a piece of legislation called Right to Work. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. And so it's, it stems from a gentleman named Vance, I want to call him a gentleman, a guy named Vance Hughes, who is a Texan white supremacist. And he used um, this divisive legislation to dismantle labor unions because we were the first line of defense, because we were the only organization um, during that time to incorporate uh, black and whites. And so he uses the saying, um, white women and white men will be forced to organize, forced into organizations with black African apes and forced to call them brothers. And so that um, legislation is still around to this day. There's a decision called the Janus decision that came down from the Supreme Court. And that's definitely, that stems in right to work. So as much as they use the word freedom and liberty, it's actually the opposite of that. Um, so we fight that constantly um, within our own ranks and with um, the federal government, as we know, and it's not easy. And so that is our three-prong approach. None of it can be done in tiers. It's all one-stop shop. We have to do it all together because I don't want to bring our community into a place that they don't feel welcome to. So we have to do this all simultaneously. So that's just some of the work we're doing. Word. Um, well, I'm involved in like a lot of different spaces and organizing, um, so I'll speak from what's on my heart right now. Um, and it's actually a pretty, it's been a heavy couple of weeks out here in Beach. Um, if y'all follow the news at all, uh, y'all may have seen that we lost a young man on Monday. His name was Davion Jackson Day, a 16 year old junior. Um, and some of the work that our organization, Walk Black, is doing at Rainier Beach is looking to end suspension and expulsion. Um, within schools, and that's not movements that we've started, but that's us building upon organizing that's been taking place. To be honest, since 1600s when public education became a thing. Um, and we do that through restorative justice and transformative justice. And here's why we are against uh, suspension and expulsion. I can give you three examples of things that have happened to students that have been suspended while they were on suspension they may end up in the prison industrial complex. We've got a young man that will be graduating right now that's going to be looking at a couple of years right now. Um, a young man passed away on Monday. Um, he died on Monday after he got expelled. Um, and as we're looking at the education system, we're looking at the practices of how discipline is done in schools, it's eerily correlated with the prison industrial complex. And y'all have heard probably from Michelle Alexander, if you haven't been inside schools, about the school to prison pipeline. But I'm here to tell y'all that that is absolutely real. There ain't nothing exaggerate about that. It's not hyperbole. It's not excess. If anything, it's underwritten. Um, and through my engagement with young people at Rainier Beach High School specifically, and I've worked in probably over 20 different uh, schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, throughout Seattle Public Schools, um, I can tell you that black young ladies and black young men, Southeast Asian young men and young ladies, um, Latinx young folk, are disproportionately affected by the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that's something that I think everybody knows now. There's not a person in the room that would disagree with me. I would hope not. There's not a person in the room that would disagree with that. But when we talk about the urgency of how important it is that we are losing young people and they're being profited off of, 
And we got brothers on this panel right now that can even tell y'all what it's like from the inside. Okay, so we got young people that are getting pushed into that prison that they're building up the street. Okay, and they're not getting opportunities in schools. I work at Rainier Beach High School, the most underfunded high school in the state of Washington. We've actually been having these conversations about how underfunding schools increases the likelihood of students not being able to succeed post high school or even graduating from high school. Um, and so through implementing restorative justice, we're pushing back against the administration's inclination to suspend um, uh, and expel students, as well as pushing back against the uh, detention practices because it's not corrective, it's not restorative, it's not transformative. In fact, 87% of the folk that have been locked in the state of Washington have been suspended or expelled at some point. And so what we want to look to do is actually engage the core, the root of whatever problems could be happening. We want to encourage the adults in the building to understand y'all the ones creating the culture and the climate of the school. And that when it comes to schools, uh, much power we want, to, we want to empower our young people to be able to lead the campuses, but it's the adults that actually create the norms that will happen, especially in regards to discipline. Um, and so through restorative and transformative justice, we have a couple of coordinators at the school. Uh, we've been able to deter a number of situations in which students will probably be suspended or expelled. Um, we've been able to bring their families in, uh, teachers in, create um, like a community stakeholder group for each student that we've engaged with to basically show if a young person has a support system, I guarantee that whatever behavior you're talking about is uh, defiant or whatever, it can be addressed that they are having their basic needs met. Uh, oftentimes, at Rainer Beach, we got students that need IEPs, individual educational programs. And if they don't have one of those, and they're getting put in regular classes. And if they're met with an academic challenge that they don't feel that they can accomplish because of, if they had an IEP, they would have someone to support them with that. And so then they respond to the academic challenge by acting out. And then they're punished. Then they're disciplined. And then they're kicked out of school. And, or they're sent to South Lake. Um, and South Lake High School is a school across the street. It's an alternative school. Um, and this is like really near and dear to my heart. This work that we're doing because I've been working at Rainer Beach for going on five years and I've seen a lot of young people slip through the cracks. Um, and as much work as we can try to do, we need more of it. Um, and so one of the things that I'm committed to is my vision is to start an educational uh, facility. Uh, and I'll end by addressing what education really should be. Um, the first educational facilities were created in Met um, in East Africa. Um, and it wasn't about putting in an empty vessel and filling up empty vessels. It was about extracting the brilliance that we already know is within, not just young people, but adults as well. So education should not stop when you're 18. Education should not cost $30,000 a year. <laughs> education should not be white women teaching you Spanish. Okay? <laughs> okay? Um, but looking at the root of what education is supposed to be, and that's extracting brilliance inside of vessels that are already filled to the brim. But I can tell you from all my years of working in education that that is not the pedagogy that the University of Washington is teaching teachers to think like. That is not the pedagogy that Seattle University, Seattle Pacific University is raising their teachers to believe that every single student that's in their classroom is capable of excellence. That's not what they're teaching them. And so they're walking into classrooms assuming that because a student is not engaging with the lesson, that's probably boring and outdated <laughs> and straight up lies. So sometimes, sometimes there's real lying to them. They're not, but walk into a history class in high school, you will hear like outright lies. There's textbooks called us indentured servants. Okay? So lies are occurring. When we look at students, like that, there's no way that we're going to be able to empower them, as Sister said. Um, and so Kuji Chagalia, self-determination, that is one thing that we're trying to build with the young people that we're working with. Um, and we do that through organizing, um, giving them opportunities to lead, um, organizing efforts. Um, um, shout out to Mary Baum, keep shouting her out, because she's a young revolutionary in the world right now. Um, a few years ago, there was a movement um, around transportation justice um, and from targeted universalism. Rainer Beach students being the most disproportionately affected by this issue, they raised up their voice around how transportation injustice affects graduation rates. And from that movement, the city of Seattle, the Seattle Council, Seattle, excuse me, the Seattle City Council put up $1 million to provide worker cars for students that qualify for free and reduced lunch. That was the first year. Then y'all's mayor, I don't call my mayor, y'all mayor Jenny Durkin, then expanded the Orca Car program, and now every student 
that qualifies. Every student that is in high school in, in the city of Seattle has a free Orca card. And that is 100% because students at Rainier Beach raised up an issue that centered them, but they knew that if you raise up people that are at the bottom, then everybody will benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are some of the things that we've been organizing around um, this past school year. There's been a lot of us lifting up toxic masculinity, patriarchy, and how that manifests in the school. Um, from leadership and admin to the relationship with students. And I'll just give you an example of how we can transform um, punitive discipline to being more restorative and transformative. Um, in the beginning of the school year, there was a young man that was being accused of um, some overtouching and um, inappropriate relationships with certain uh, young ladies. We were able to have conversations with him, bring his family in, and really get to the root of why he had these experiences. Uh, this young man, since the beginning of the school year now, has been helping organize groups for the young men on campus and the teachers on campus uh, to have conversations about toxic masculinity and how they manifest in men specifically um, and the ways that we are wired that we don't even think about how we manifest those things. Um, so this young man went from being accused of doing something to being put in a position where he could be an educator um, and create spaces for other young men to learn from him and to learn with each other and how we can change the ways uh, that we manifest the toxic things that are within us. Um, and so it's less work, it's hard work, it's hard work, sometimes you cry, um, but I believe that education has always been political, and that's the reason why they try to keep us out of it, and that's the reason why they won't fund our schools, and that's the reason why it costs money, to be honest. Um, so education has always been political, and will always be political, um, and I believe that it is um, a vehicle of our liberation. Um, and so I'll pass the mic to the brothers that's over here. Thank you. I just I just continue on to what uh, Jarrell just touched upon. Like for myself, I was I was suspended. I think I think it was in the seventh grade in the uh, in middle school. I was suspended in the seventh grade and I never came back. You know, I, I mean, at, at the time I didn't think about it in that way in that manner. I just never came back. And a couple of years later, a couple of years later, I was doing life in prison. But, and that just speaks to the level of what suspension can mean for a young person in, in marginalized communities and black and brown communities and stuff. And uh, yeah, it wasn't no surprise that even before I knew about the school to prison pipeline, it wasn't no surprise that upon going to prison as a young man, I mean, I, I, that's where I first met Gerald, uh, by the way. And upon going to prison as a young man with a life sentence, as a 15 year old, it was no surprise that a lot of the folks that were in prison with me were a lot of the folks that were in the community with me, right? A lot, of, a lot of the young men that I grew up with uh, were in prison with me. So I think with, with that being said, for us, it was like we came into the, yes, we were young gangbangers, young ruthless, menace kids, and all that, all that other stuff. But I think at some point in time during our incarceration, we came to some consciousness that it's not because of our own doing, it's not because of who we are that put us where we're at now. So then we began to organize, whether it was with the BBC or the APIC and G, we began to organize and we began to raise consciousness within ourselves. Like when we talk about the liberatory education, we talk about how how not 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 to get into not to get into higher education, not to get into academia, but how could we liberate our own selves and our own mind into what, into our own self-worth. So fortunate for me, uh, just, just like Gerald, I, I was granted release a couple years ago. And that organizing has continued and I just kind of fell in with the uh, no new jail movement. It was like, like it just spoke to my heart, it just spoke to what I believe in, and seeing all the, all the young men that went to prison with me and who were suffering because of the system. And, we, and when we talk about the jail, yes, they, they invested over like $300 million in the jail so far, and they're still asking for more money. You know, it, it just speaks to a lot of what they think about us in our communities. Uh, and and right, now, right now, I think the narrative in King County, in Seattle, is that, oh, this jail, this jail is complete, y'all just need to shut up. And for, and for me, and for me and our collective, we, we believe that the jail is symbolic of what they think of us. Whether it's completed or not, it's symbolic of what they think about our communities and our people, right? And 
and and for me, as long, if if I'm as long as I'm here, as long as I'm alive and kicking, in regards to the young men and women that are, that are still suffering under those conditions, that are still led down the path to prison, uh, in regards to the men and women that are still left behind bars, behind prisons and cages, that went to prisons, that went to prison as 16, 17, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, as teenagers, and are doing life sentences because they couldn't find no other avenues within the systems that's not, that's not set up for us. Uh, I'm going to continue to fight that fight. We're going to continue to remind this liberal government, this neoliberal government, this uh, passive progressive government that, that we're not going for your bullshit. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not going we're, we're to fall for that trickery of, oh, everything's okay now because people, people got jobs and some, and, and people got jobs and because <laughs> And because some people are in higher education, you know, there's 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 a body of my community, of our community, that's still left behind, that are still excluded. And I think that's what's wrong with Seattle is that they put up this progressiveness to the rest of the nation, to the rest of the world. But how, however, there's still people marginalized, still suffering, and still excluded from having access to social mobility. And I, I don't think I don't think that's by accident. You know, I don't, I don't think that's by accident. I definitely think that's by design. And and like like Jarrell said, like the same things we were talking about that folks were talking about years and years and years ago are still happening today. It's just that they have a better way of narrating it today. They have a better way of presenting it to everybody today that uh, people have come to accept that we're okay, that everything's going to be all right. But you know, when we talk about this jail, the symbolism of what it is, like it's being built in the central district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of all places, in the CD, a place where black, brown, and Asian folks were redlined in. Mm -hmm. Remember, they said the CD was going to fall apart mm -hmm. when they redlined black, brown, and Asian folks in there. They said there was going to be a gigantic mudslide, mm -hmm. and everybody that lived there was just going to fall off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's why they put us there. And now, because of it's, it's still there. We built a community there. We built structure there. It's still there. But now that it's still there, we made it beautiful. We made it a community. Let's kick everybody out. Let's let everybody else come in. Let's build a jail as a symbol of we don't really don't want you here. Right? Let's let Uncle Ike do a beach <laughs> and profit millions and millions of dollars what they used to criminalize yep. black and brown folks off of. Look at the pain on the wall. Yeah, and I, and I think that just speaks to a lot of bullshit that goes on in Seattle. And, and I, I think for myself, for folks that I organize with, for the men that I organize with inside, whether it's the BBC, the API, CAG, it's like, we know what's happening. We're not going to go for the bullshit. Like, yes, we're, gonna, we're, willing, we're willing to put our freedom on the line. We're willing to put our lives on the line because we believe in what it is. And for me, like, although I'm free, and Gerald could probably speak to this too, that although I'm free, I don't feel like I'm free or I'm liberated until everybody else is free to mm -hmm. That's my stance for me. And, and, and yeah, these are my brothers, these are my sisters that I came up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm not black, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I would say I get the suffering. I get the pain and the how, because it impacted me. It impacted me. Like, I was on that same pathway, right? I just happened to be one of the very fortunate and exceptional one that made it out. A lot of young men and women are put down that path and never get off that path. Whether it's a lifetime of drug abuse, whether it's a lifetime of alcoholism, whether it's a lifetime of domestic abuse or incarceration, a lot of folks don't get out of that cycle that these systems and these conditions put us in. So what are we going to do to fight that? And, and that's what we continue to do with the Known New Jail Collective, with the, with the campaign. Is that it's not exactly about the jail, but it's more about these systems, the prison industrial complex, the school to, school to prison pipeline that continues to put black and brown folks, Southeast Asian folks, marginalized communities, poor communities on this path to, if you ain't got nothing to contribute to us, if you ain't got nothing to give us, if you can't fall in line, assimilate to our norms, 
right, to our traditions, to white supremacy, that we ain't got no place for you. You can't fall in line to capitalism that doesn't, that doesn't support us, that doesn't make the one percenters better, that we don't have no place for you. And this is the way we're going to exclude you. We're going to build up the criminal legal system. We're going to continue to invest in the police force, the prison system. We're going to disinvest in your schools. And we got a path for you that we could profit off of. And I think for folks in my collective, the folks that I organize with in the new No New Jail campaign with APICAG, we understand that. And we're not going to go for no bullshit. Right? Uh, we're going to continue to fight back. We're going to continue to stand up. I don't, I don't care who's the governor. I don't care who's the King County executive. Like they, they already did what they already did to me. What else could they do to me? Right? They, 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 all, my, my, life has, my life to them is, is already disposable. A lot of people from my community, our lives are already disposable. So I'm not, for me, I'm not going to go for that stuff. I'm not going to go for that bullshit. I'm gonna continue to remind, we're going to continue to remind them that we're here. We're not going anywhere. No matter what lawsuit that we lost in regards to the jail, like, like I said, the jail is just a symbol of the racism that is in Seattle. Point blank. Right? And what are we going to do from this point forward? As we understand the prison industrial complex, it's not just a jail, it's just not a prison. It's all those things that encompass us being led down those paths. But like even even for me right now, like I'm at the University of Washington, I'm a student there, and, and, and that shit's hella complicated for me. I'm, I'm super conflicted about being in an institution and the privilege I have in that institution and knowing how it contributes to our society and the ideas that go out into society, how it contributes to the prison industrial complex. Right? The minds that they are forming there of all these privileged kids. Or the minds that are going to go into their leadership positions in the future that is going to make those decisions that affect our community. And, and, and that's what's at stake here. Are we, are we going to take the position of just being bystanders or just stepping back? Or are we going to take the position as uh, getting into those positions, going within those institutions, and, make, and making those decisions that's going to help our community, that's going to, that's going to, that are going to impact our kids? And I think stuff like the wonderful Molly Mitchell is doing and running for school board. Uh, support Molly Mitchell and her running for school board. Uh, six. Yeah. <laughs> we need more black and brown folks in those positions that have that have that have decision making powers in our communities with our children. I think that's super important. And, and yeah, I think that's why I'm here. That's that's why I continue to fight. That's why I stop stand in solidarity with folks and you know, keep on reminding me. Fake ass. <laughs> Neoliberal Seattle. <laughs> yeah, things are not okay. Right? Things are not alright. You're, you're the richest state in the world, richest city, one of the richest cities in the world, and people are still suffering. Yeah. Yep. There's something really wrong with that. You can't figure that out. And you got this great government, this great these city's officials with all this money. You can't figure out why there's a homelessness problem. You can't figure out why you can't get funding for Rainier Beach. Then there's a problem. It's either there's a problem, or it's, a, it, or it's an accepted status quo, and that's what I believe it is. It's an accepted status quo to continue to benefit the privilege. And yeah, we're here. We're not going to go for the bullshit. <laughs> Sort of, let me just give you a little bit. I'm going to tell you a quick story and let me just give you a background. With the NWC, when I came home, I made a commitment. I want to give a shout out to Professor Livingston here, who's been on the board of the NWC as long as I've been there. And we've had some good times and some yeah. struggles and challenges with this city. And I don't reach the point to, well, I'm not even interested in arguing or even in debating anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many more examples do we need to know what we know? I don't need another example of proving mm -hmm. why Trump's a racist. He's blatantly a racist. Just call it what it is. And I'm sick of debating it with people. Yeah. And well, maybe, well, because those are the people that kept us in slave. And when you go back and look at particularly on Juneteenth, we actually won the right to vote in 1865, but we didn't get the right to vote until 1965. For me, mm -hmm. what happened in that 100 years? Mm -hmm. 
and a lot of it was internal amongst our own people because just because you're my color don't make you my kind. Mm -hmm. And two, that we still always try to, they try to good in Seattle how to distract you from getting to the point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give an example that on the night when I became president, I didn't know I was going to become president, by the way. It's our 100th anniversary. We out at a big hotel, and that's when the president said, you know, the night's it, right? I said, what are you talking about? I'm stepping down. Automatically counterpulled me into that seat. And I wasn't ready for it because I've only been home a couple of years, and I'm still trying to figure out Seattle. Because remember, I came up here from the south, and before I even had a chance to know anybody, I'm gone. <laughs> then I come back in this city, seeing cell phones, and God knows everything else. I'm just oblivious to it. But there's a kid that I used to go to high school basketball games, and this kid that I always called him my kid because I don't have any, but I called him my kid. And I used to go to the basketball games, and we used to go to Bapo High. This is um, I've only been the president like two months. And this kid that I happen to like, because I like the style that he played, there's a story I'm sure y'all going to relate to when I connect it. I ain't going to tell you his name. And he got suspended with two weeks left in school because he was in the classroom and he sang, the teacher said, you got any questions? And this white kid kept raising his hand, kept raising his hand. The bell went wrong, kept raising his hand. He finally just shuts up. That's not left to retard it. Because he said that word, this white kid trip that goes to the principal's office, and they suspend this kid for the remaining two weeks, which I call expulsion, and he could not participate in basketball during the summer year, during the summer. He was a uh, junior. So me and Dr. Felton decided, let's go educate these white folks down here in Bothell, because clearly in our community, we say that we're retarded a lot. Now, we didn't know you forbid this word, but we say retarded, that's funny, clowning, or whatever, but to give this kid the ultimate expulsion that was going to harm him, he wasn't going to be able to graduate, that's all I saw mm -hmm. at the time. Well, of course, you know, they were scared of the end of the speed. They decided we can't bring him back to school, but we're going to provide all of his online classes so he can catch up and keep up with all this stuff. Went on for his next year, did phenomenal, got accepted by UCLA, played one year, and became the 11th pick in the NBA draft, Zach Levine. Dunk contest. Yes. And it won a slam dunk contest in the last two years. Now, how funny it is, because he knew at least I thought he did, about the word retarded and how this really was and how to create this dichotomy in the school that he got it. But then on the night before we get drafted, he's just like, look me. And here's headlines ESPN. I was like, Zach, did you want anything about it? <laughs> anything? But it just shows you that when you care about someone enough to go there and reach out to them and educate this school about this kid, they would have actually ruined this whole career in his life. Mm -hmm. That's when I say, you know what, I'm done. I'm done sitting at the table with the mayor. Y'all's mayor too. Damn sure ain't mine. Now, because these are people that love to sit down and say, we're going to have you at the table to talk about it, talk about it. We've been talking about it for 400 years. How much more talking is going to be needed? When we go all the way back and think about what Juneteenth and what it signified, it actually signified that slavery had, it was really Lincoln that negotiated with uh, its counterparts, I ain't going to say the words, counterparts because he said, okay, we're going to punish you if you don't free your slave, then, I mean, if you don't free, come to build a union, we're going to free your slave. It was more of a threat. It wasn't, and then even though he freed the slaves, it didn't apply to nobody because he didn't even control the area that were even slaves. But then after they passed the Article, you know, 15th Amendment, uh, 13th Amendment, remember that language. It said, slavery in this country is hereby abolished, comma, except for those convicted of a crime. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that told the slave owners to do? <clears throat> and you think we confuse on why our prison population is mirrors our slave population back then? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to have a PhD to understand this. And that same system been put in place that have perpetuated the, uh, all the different eight institutions on, built on racism. I'm just sick of arguing with folks that reject it outright because they'll say to me, Jerry, you find race in everything. And I'll find that, no, you just don't find race in shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you do the math. But here in Seattle, and I've been fortunate enough since I've been home, and now that I'm the regional president, I go to Alaska, Oregon, and Washington, and I will do that. I had 52 cities about two years ago, and I will honestly say to you, city of Seattle is one of the racist cities I came across in America. Real talk. And I'm going to tell you why it's so racist, I'm going to tell you why it's so dangerous. Because when you go down to Alabama, you know what you get. Get your black guys out of here, boy. But then you come to Seattle, hey, my friend, how you doing? I can work with you on this. Next thing you know, they cut your throat. Mm -hmm. At least I know what I'm dealing with here. And then when you look at these institutions that you have folks that say, we want to bring you to the table because they want to use your good name to put you on the front of their brochure mm -hmm. and make you look like you're doing some wonderful work because they're pimping our people. Yep. It's like they're pimping our community. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I'm the one that I'm sure some people in this room probably wouldn't know say that I'm the one that ain't getting mad at in Seattle. I'm the one on Q13 cussing them out. But I tell them all, oh, look, I'm not interested in being nobody's friend anymore because clearly you don't have our best interests as a people. Mm -hmm. Now, I would love to someday leave Seattle and say go and retire, just get away from the whole world because I think Seattle's actually going backwards, mm -hmm. giving us a few things, saying we're making progress, and the next thing you know, you look up and we're all screwed. Mm -hmm. When I look at a lot of policy, there's one, there's a couple of areas here that I particularly worked on, and I did it for a particular reason because I wanted to send a message. I ain't going to tell you everything about it because some of it's ongoing. That we pushed a bill in Seattle, that's what I think I ran in you last year, that stopping evictions after three days in the city of Seattle, mm -hmm. particularly in the region, because in Seattle, that the eviction rate is the second house of Tacoma, and out of every 10 evictions that happen, five of them is black women. Mm -hmm. Five. They got buildings downtown full of black women. Mm -hmm. So the question became, so we started talking to folks, going to meet these folks, and then we found out this sister that actually lost her apartment only because she owed $7. Mm -hmm. yeah. $7. And even when you go try to give the landlord the money for two days later, they don't take it. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why they was doing that, because they said, now you gave an excuse that I need to get your back out of there, and I can now get fair market value. Mm -hmm. So we adopted, we wrote a deal. We lined up, and I think thank y'all with WLSC for being there to support us. But then the bill went all the way up, all the way up, and now this way they all got mad at me. The black people in the room that said the legislator voted against it. <coughs> voted against it. And these are the same two people that I'm saying, okay, and the only thing we were asking, mm -hmm. give them 14 days. Mm -hmm. If they come up with the money, mm -hmm. accept it. Don't reject it. Then the two black folk, well, one ain't really black. Well, okay. yeah. 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 He's there. Yeah. So is she. But, uh, but these people was not considering race when it comes to the impact of race. Mm -hmm. The most recent one on the three strikes you're out there, we worked on that. Mm -hmm. They excluded everybody that said, oh, you're not going to make it retroactive. Just that one word disqualifies 67% of the people that's in prison for robbery, too, that don't qualify. But they thinking that's a victory. Mm -hmm. So I did a post. So what I did on Q13, I, I didn't do it there. Somebody did it. But I actually wrote a letter to the entire legislature, and I didn't even leak it to the media, mm -hmm. and called them out. Called them out, how dare you stand on the back of our people to get in your post, but then forget about people mm -hmm. after you get there. Mm -hmm. How dare you vote no? Mm -hmm. And then one so-called sister decided that she want to fire back, like Q13 is setting you up, sister, because why do you want to fire back at me? They had a whole series about it, because I called it out. And I made sure I wanted to call it out to let the public know. My job is to create the awareness for y'all to get it, and y'all take this amount of time. You can't come in the game in the third quarter, though, want to be the quarterback. you got to start this game plan starts from the beginning. But the whole notion for what I'm pushing is making sure that y'all got to be aware enough to not let the wool get pulled over your eyes. Mm -hmm. When you think about the right to vote, you remember anybody in this room know what, when we won the right to vote, did anybody know what the test was, what, they, what your requirement was before you could vote? Does everybody know that? Everything. Encyclopedia, constitutions, oh, everything. Everything. The first test was how many jelly beans is in the jar? How many jelly beans is in the jar, right? Because white folks say, well, the white folks say we got to give you a competency test. So the white folks say, how many jelly beans is in this jar? Yeah. And then after 10 years, they realize, okay, okay, we were just playing, okay, we'll change. You're right, you're right. How many bubbles in this bar so? Now, you have to be really stupid to think that they have any intentions on giving us the right to vote. And no matter what I say to you today, you can trust me, not what my great belief in this, all these things that we face and we deal dealing with hinges on the fact that we got the right to vote. That is the foundation of the NWC 110 years ago. That right to vote gave you that power. That's why so much evidence stripped that away from you. Pretty soon they're going to call us all immigrants, which we all are immigrants, just to take that strip your right to wait to have a voice, not only just in the city, but in this country. And then we have some of these people emerging as leaders make all the promises on the campaign trail, but then they get up in there and the politicians change. So when I don't always like to go to groups to sit down and talk to them because sometimes those are the people that actually stand in the way of progress. But my job is to be as far extended as I can to expose it and then let y'all be the ones to go in and negotiate this, this policy. Because there's too many of them. And it's always compound all of them with whether it be housing, whether it be jail, whether it be prisons, whether it be health care. They come, put them all together to make us seem like we fight each other over the cross so that comes up for us. The most important thing we can do as a culture, as a people, and I'm just talking about people of color, I ain't just talking about blacks. Mm -hmm. Recognize this. So consolidate this and unify to break these systems down. 
because they pit us against each other. I also noticed the one thing that I noticed that's being personified, that when we pushed the I-2, I-1000, again, Carl Livingston, everybody was there, they had a room full of Asian people wearing white shirts and said, yep, no, yep, yep. this undermines our ability yep. to champion what we do, particularly down in the university district. Mm -hmm. So now they're created dissension between the Asian community and the black community. Yep. To this very day, now the Asian community run a referendum 88 to undo that, which is intentionally going to cause conflict against our people. And this is where we have to be careful. Because when we fall into those traps, that's exactly yeah. what they want. <clears throat> I don't understand how this affirmative action is going to hurt somebody else that should qualify for it too, but I'll leave that politics aside. But for us, and for me, and the NAACP, we're going to always stand with ain't no single fight we're going to run from. <laughs> Not one. In fact, most of them we run too, thanks to KL. Because a lot of times she brings, when we go out to address the police killings, hey, come on, y'all. You cannot, or you cannot tell me that's not the same as what lynching was back mm -hmm. in the last 80 years. That's lynching's to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every time you see a police shoot a brother or a black person, ex felon shot by cops. Mm -hmm. But when they shoot a white person, <laughs> father of three shot by cops. Right. Yeah. It's intentionally mm -hmm. put into your mind. So I'm going to put a challenge out there for labor, but I think that the police department should be required to do your analysis test. <laughs> I know they don't but do that. Certain. But yeah. I'll be right. I'm just saying, if I was, if I worked down at the warehouse and went to labor, I got to do a UA. I do. In fact, they're so cold about it that when they actually shoot and kill the person, they actually UA that person to see if he or she had drugs in their system, but not the cop. So when you start pushing things like that with your man, watch what you get, because these police have rights. These are organized, paid killers. I just follow the record because I know I'm probably going to get back to the news tomorrow that Gerald said it. Oh, he's anti-cop. No, I'm anti-racist cop. Mm -hmm. And in my world, in my experience that I went through in the prison system of what they did to me, and number one, I have the right to say it, number two, that I don't think a judge's gavel is no different than a racist cop's gun. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again so the rest of you A judge's gavel is no different than a racist cop's gun. Mm -hmm. If they don't shoot you and kill you, on the street, they're going to kill you in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. You choose which death you want to die. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that when I think about history and I think about what Juneteenth signified, <coughs> those are the things that remind me of. And it's hard to believe that I know that many of our ancestors are rolling over in their grave wondering, why are we still wallowing in the same mud they wallowed in? Why are we still fight each other and fight the same fight we fought for and wish they last for? People love to say, oh, we progressed, we've come a long way. Where did we go? Where actually did we go? They still killing us. They just got slick, but they ain't put the rope around our neck. Well, some of them do, but they ain't put the rope around our neck. Well, they killing us in the street in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. But when are we as a crowd or group of people going to understand it enough and not justify this say, well, he did have a gun, but it was in a sock. Right. <laughs> All that is driving me. That's bullshit. That's <laughs> <laughs> But I'll end, I'll end by saying that, you know, I've, I've reached a point to where I don't like sitting at those tables anymore because the conversation time is over for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in engaging in this conversation because we don't have this a thousand times. At what point am I going to accept the fact you just ain't listening and don't care? Mm -hmm. I'm not even interested in saying, well, can we come up with an idea? Mm -hmm. Like, no, come up with the original one we came up with a hundred years ago. We still work on that. So I'm not interested in sitting at those tables. I don't. I refuse calls with mayors and even governors because there's nothing more to talk about. The people have spoken. Don't use me as your puppet to say, "Well, we worked it out with you." No, you didn't. So y'all will keep getting mad at me. Just understand that I do it intentionally to piss people off because that's who you're supposed to be uncomfortable. And when I call it to walk like a duck and quack like a duck, I'm gonna call it a duck, not a bird, not a bird. That's the NWCP. We stand on the right of fight for civil rights. We hope that people wake up and realize that all of us, all of us. are in danger. All of us. Look at America today. They love to talk about Trump, but one thing Trump did do is expose exactly how many people in this country that think like him. Yeah. And he didn't vote himself in. Yeah, but I'm saying that the fact he didn't vote himself in, but I imagine when you got that many people that think like him, is in places right down here in these local governments. And you actually got a captain that's actually on the police force right now that is staunch Trump. And you wonder, why is he allowed to be on the force? 
That's the intentions of that that started way back when that's what GT started. 